As we move forward in calculus, in particular, as we start trying to do things with limits, we're going to have to be a little more particular about what we mean and how we define the limit of a function at a certain value so that we can actually do stuff with it. Let's first, let's go back a little bit and think more about generally what a limit is. So this idea of a limit was the value that a function is getting close to as the input or the x value approaches a certain number. So it's the value that a function is tending towards as the input value x approaches a certain number. And in particular, we'll see again our definitions here, this is not related to the actual value of the function at that point. These are two entirely different concepts. Now what we saw in our first exposure to this was this is really useful and can be used to sort of figure things out when the function is not even defined at the point in question. So of particular use is when a function is not even defined at the point in question. In that case, we don't have an actual value f of zero, for instance, to compare to. All we have to look at is the limit as we get closer and closer to zero of this function. So two examples that we'll see over the next couple days are these two functions. f of x is sine of x over x. If you look at the graph of this function, we can first know that f is not defined at zero because I have an x in the denominator, so I can't plug in zero. But if we graph this out and plug in some numbers, we will see that this value here is at one. So it seems like near zero, that function f is getting really, really close to one, which is maybe our limit consisting about that, where the function itself can't because it's not defined at zero. The other main example is one that we've seen previously, or something similar to it, where the graph of this looks like a straight line with the hole at, in this case, negative three. So the limit here would look like it should be negative six, but the function itself can't say that because it's not defined at negative three. So how can we go about actually defining this limit idea so that we can actually do more things with it? So our first definition here, staying more on the informal side, is that we see the limit of f of x as x approaches c is l, which is written as shown here, limit under it, x approaches c, f of x the function inside equals l. And we say this if f of x gets closer and closer to L as X gets closer and closer to C. This sort of gets across the idea of this approaching that we mentioned before, right? As X approaches C, it's getting closer and closer to C. And as it does so, we want the value of F of X, the function F where I plug in that closer and closer value of X to get closer and closer to L. This seems like a good place to start. However, it has some issues with it. And in math, we are generally very particular at how we define things so that we get exactly the result we want every time we do so. So we're gonna nitpick a little bit and see where this definition might not be great so we can refine it and make it better and more exactly what we actually want. So here's an example of the situation I'm thinking about here. Take the function x squared and look as x goes to zero. And I want to argue that by that definition, we could say the limit as x goes to zero of f of x or x squared here is negative one. Well. This seems to make sense. As x gets closer to zero, the value of x squared is getting smaller. And so it's getting closer and closer to negative one. Because negative one is less than everything x squared could ever be. When x squared is getting smaller, it's getting closer and closer to minus one. However, this doesn't match our picture idea. Right, our picture idea would tell us, if I draw the graph of x squared, the limit here should be zero. Because that's what the graph is tending towards as x gets closer and closer to zero. What this really means is that this worded version here isn't really good enough to be the definition of a limit because it doesn't give us the right result in all the cases we're looking at here. How can we define this better? So a better definition here, we want to make sure it encompasses all the things that we really care about for the setup and for what the limit actually does. So our other assumption here, we want our function f, make sure it's defined in an interval around the point c, but not necessarily at the actual value of c. So assume that f of x is the function defined on some interval around a point c, but not necessarily at c. f of c could be undefined. I don't really care. This definition will still work. Then we say our result limit x approaches c of f of x equals l if the gap between f of x and l, so absolute value, f of x minus l can be made arbitrarily small by choosing x sufficiently close to c. Caveat, but not equal to c. 
Okay, that wording feels strange there. But what it does is it fixes our previous problem, right? The, the weird wording here is in this arbitrarily small and sufficiently close bit. But all this means is that if you give me some threshold, you say, I want you to put the value of x to be within 0 0.001 of L. If this limit exists and equals L, I can then go back and say, I can do that. And you have to pick x within 0 0.0001 of C, and then it works. So it's sort of a back and forth game here. You pick any threshold for how far you are away from L, and then I will come back and tell you, here's how close you have to be to C to make that work. Now, why does this fix our problem? Well, it fixes our problem because for our function being x squared again, the gap between x squared and one is never arbitrarily small. No matter what I pick for x, I cannot make this be less than one because x squared is always positive or at least zero. And so that absolute value gap is always at least one. So if you give me a cutoff, say, make it be you know, less than one half away, I cannot do that. I cannot pick x to make this gap less than one half. So this can't be the limit because it cannot be arbitrarily small. The only value that works here is zero. Any other value you pick, you can always sort of play with this threshold thing to make it not work. And so now this lines up with what our picture says for what this limit should be. I will say there is a more formal definition in section 2.3. If you've heard of the epsilon and delta definition, that's what's in there. That is not going to be covered in this course, but it's there if you want to look at it to actually see how you go one step beyond this and that you can actually use to prove stuff. But this sort of intuition of I can make the gap between my function and this limit arbitrarily small by getting close enough to C is really the idea that this builds off of. As a notational thing, we can also write this just as f of x arrow to L when x arrow to C. If you've got a thing to write in a little different format, you don't have to write the whole limit thing. As long as you keep the arrows involved to indicate that a limit's going on here, it works out fine. The other thing to mention here is that it's also possible for a limit to not exist. So it is possible that there is no such L for which the definition holds true. So an example here is something like 1 over x squared. If we draw the graph of this, the graph looks something like this. And we could look for the limit as x goes to zero of one over x squared. What happens here? Well, as x gets closer and closer to zero, it's getting really small. And so one over x squared gets really, really big, really, really fast. And so there is no number L for which this gets closer and closer as x goes to zero. So this limit does not exist because there is no number that it approaches. And we'll see other examples of this as we go through stuff in the rest of this chapter. Again, last comment, make sure that we're on the same page with this. The value at C does not matter for this. If we go back to our definition, there's this caveat here of but not equal to C. So this definition does not even check what F does at C. It doesn't look at it, doesn't care about it, does nothing to do with that idea. And so the actual value at C has no impact on the limit. There's a slightly more concrete definition of a limit and how it actually works. And we'll be able to then use this to do a lot more things with limits as we go forward.